Welcome everybody to the Unit 2 video. So we're on Chapter 27. <clears throat> and remember that the first half I'm going to go through uh, in relative detail here in the video. Um, so you can just kind of skim along. But certainly the last four pages you need to pay good attention to um, because that's a little bit more difficult to understand. And that's this multiplier portion that I refer to here. So consumption and savings. So consumption and savings are all about um, you know, they're, they're sort of inverse to each other. And it's going to be primarily determined by disposable income. You remember that from the income, uh, you know, portion of arriving at GDP. Um, we didn't talk a ton about it, but that's, that's where it comes from. So there's a direct relationship. Um, and the consumption schedule is how much households plan on spending. And then the savings schedule is how much they plan on saving, which of course is disposable income less consumption. And there can be what we call dis-saving. Dis-savings can happen through either borrowing or spending what you have previously saved. So spending savings from the past, so decreasing your wealth basically. So this schedule right here, okay, this line gives us, uh, the red line, gives us a, a line that means, this, this is what it looks like when everybody spends everything. So here, if you make $5,000 and you consume $5,000, that's the 45 degree angle. The dots are the amount in various years that was actually spent. So in 1987, uh, income, disposable income was right here. But saving, or I'm sorry, but spending was down here. So this little difference right there is savings. We can stretch it out. You can see in 2004, for example, we saved a little bit more. In 2009, we saved quite a bit more. So why did we save so much more in 2009? Well, during the uh, recession, we had pretty poor expectations of the future. So people don't want to consume, they want to save. Now, this is going to be important primarily because A, it's the data that we're going to see in a bunch of other graphs, but all of these, okay, so saving is 1 minus 2, so DI minus C. So this is really what you want to be paying attention to, APC, APS, and especially MPC and MPS. These are the two most important. So this data gets graphed here, okay? So here is our 45 degree line, that was the red line in the previous one. And then here is our consumption schedule. So notice, as uh, disposable income falls, we save less and less. Basically what that means is there's a, just a certain amount of money that we kind of got to spend. And if, if nationally we make a smaller amount, then we just aren't able to save anything. So dis-saving occurs in this example as our income falls. So if we were in a major recession and income fell from say 450 where we have this amount of saving all the way down to 370 where we have this amount of dis saving, what that would mean is we're either borrowing a bunch of money or we're spending money that we had saved in previous years. Okay, so since consumption and saving are functions of each other, you can see that Basically, this is the same amount, so they're both zero, and then this will be equal to this, okay? Because di minus c equals s. Okay, so here are some formulas that you'll want to pay attention to. You take consumption and you divide it um, by income, and that gives you your average propensity to consume, or APC. It is the fraction of total income that's consumed. Your average propensity to save, of course, is the amount that you save divided by your income. Average propensity to save. And of course, those two together have to equal one because once again, they're functions of each other. So average propensity to consume. You can see which uh, nations are most likely to consume. Who spends the most money versus who saves more. Now, marginal is typically what we're more concerned with. You've learned that over the course of the semester. So our change in consumption over our change in income. So basically, if I make an additional dollar, how much of that do I use to consume? So if I make, you know, if I get a raise of a thousand bucks 
and I then spend 900, then that would be 900 over the change in income, which is an extra $1,000, which would, of course, be 0.9, right? So my marginal propensity to consume is 0.9. Now, of course, because MPC plus MPS has to be 1, then I know that this is going to be 0.1. That means I'm saving 10% of the additional income that I made. So you can see that here, if our change in disposable income is $20 and our change in consumption is 15, put 15 over 20 and that gives you 0 0.75. 0 0.75 plus 0 0.25 uh, have to equal one. And you can kind of see the rise over run. It'll appease you math guys. So <clears throat> there are non-determinants, right? Or I'm sorry, non-income determinants that are gonna cause shifts of this whole line. So just like we had our non-price factors of demand and non-price factors of supply last semester in micro, we have our non-income determinants. So when our wealth changes or when borrow, oops, or when borrowing changes um, because of interest rates, um, when we are thinking that things in the future are going to be good or things that are in the future are going to be bad, that's going to change our general level of savings. It's going to take the whole curve and shift it. Now, some other um, important considerations. We've been talking about consumption, but we're not going to. We're going to sort of stop talking about consumption and start talking about real GDP. Remember that those two are very similar, and then we can have changes along the schedule. So that's a movement based upon income, and then you can have shifts, simultaneous shifts of both saving and uh, uh, consumption will always occur. Typically, they'll move in opposite directions. If we you know, consume more, then we save less. Uh, that's just kind of the way that works. The one exception is taxation. When taxes go down, we will both spend more and save more. When taxes go up, we will both spend less and save less. So most econ economists believe that these are pretty darn stable unless the government somehow intervenes typically through some change in taxes. But the shifts will be simultaneous and in opposite directions, except for a tax change, and these will be relatively stable year over year. So here is a shift of the schedule, okay? So you can see how they happen together um, and in opposite directions. So our expected rate of return, um, and the, the real interest rate, these are going to be things that will determine our investment demand curve. So here is our downward sloping investment and in demand curve. Okay, And what that means is what we're doing over here is we have the expected rate of return and real interest rate. So when our expected rate of return is really high, it almost doesn't matter what our interest rate is because we're going to do it. right? So this is going to happen even if interest rates are, are 14 because we're, we're still going to make money, right? So, but there are going to be very few investment opportunities that pay huge rates of return. But basically what it means is we will do, as businesses, we will invest first in our most likely to pay off and invest last in our least likely to pay off. So this thing that only has an expected rate of return of 2% isn't going to happen unless the real interest rate is below 2%. Now, if we are below 2%, there's going to be a tremendous amount of investment taking place. So what shifts investment demand? Well, acquisition, maintenance, and, oper and, operation and operating costs. So basically, this is you know, what we've referred to as uh, uh, depreciation and all that kind of jazz. Um, you know, when stuff, the, p the producer price index, becomes more expensive, then investment will go down. Business taxes, if taxes go down, investment goes up and the opposite. When there's a big technological change, that tends to spur investment. So, you know, if we have a, a, a great new computer program that makes businesses do better, then they'll spend kind of whatever money they need to spend buying that computer program. Um, stock of capital goods, so if they have accumulated um, a whole bunch of really great capital, uh, in the past, then they'll invest a little bit less in the future and they'll spend down the capital that they've accumulated. Same thing with inventory. If they decide that you know they're going to uh, build up a big inventory because they anticipate big sales in the future, then after they've built the inventory, then they will invest a little bit less. 
And a lot of that is very connected to expectations. When expectations are good, investment demand rises. When they're less good, investment demand falls. So these are going to be our shifts in investment demand. Investment demand increases, shifts to the right, decreases, shifts to the left. So you can see gross investment as a percentage of GDP. So South Korea has been, you know, in 2008 was really kind of pushing the investment compared to most of the rest of the world. Um, you know, maybe this was, uh, you know, when Hyundai decided to really kick it into high gear um, and become a really serious global brand. I'm sure they're doing other stuff too. Um, but since I drive a Hyundai, that's what I think about. So IG, problematically, is very volatile. We've talked about this before, the irregularity of, in, uh, of innovation, the variability of profits. All of that makes IG less stable than a lot of other uh, than consumption or government spending or even exports. So what you see here is percent change. Okay, so this is not actual IG, it's the change in IG. Okay, so your zero line here is, is flat. And when GDP falls, you can see that IG falls much more. When GDP changes positively, IG comes up. Now there are leading and lagging indicators and we're not gonna get into whether the big swing in gross investment is causing or caused by the change in GDP, that almost doesn't really matter. But this is just showing how much more volatile IG is than GDP. So the multiplier effect. The idea here is that one change in spending ripples through the economy many times. So you look at the initial change and then the multiplier is what gives you the ultimate change in GDP. So if I spend a dollar that I've never spent before at the store, then that person has an additional dollar to spend at a different store, and the next store, and the next store, and the next store. So that dollar isn't the only change in spending. In fact, there are lots and lots and lots of changes in spending. Well, what we want to do, if we're going to look at a change in GDP, is take the initial change in spending, multiply it by this multiplier number that we come up with here, and that will be the change in GDP. So <clears throat> here's what we've got. Um, the, the multiplier is going to be a function of our savings versus consumption, okay? Because we're gonna throw sort of taxes and savings into one, uh, one deal. But basically you got a five, oops, you have a $5 change in income. So 375 of that is gonna get spent because that's 0.75 of $5. And 1.25 is gonna get saved. So then the next person has 375 to save. 0.75 of that is $2.81, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can see is all of these rounds added up together start with this initial change of $5, but it actually leads to $20. Now we could do infinity rounds, understanding that they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Um, so notice this one is is bigger than this one, which is bigger than this one, which is bigger than this one, which is bigger than this one. Now this is every, shoot, this is every other round added together, which is why it then gets bigger again. But clearly we don't want to add up infinity rounds. So what can we do? We can figure out our multiplier. So we know that MPC and MPS are functions of each other. So the multiplier, I typically look at it just for simpler math as one over the MPS, or it could also be one over one minus the MPC. Um, so when the multiplier is big, that's going to give us um, uh, a large change in spending. But when we consume a lot, that's going to give us a bigger multiplier. Okay. So you can imagine if we consume 95% and we only save 5%, then that's going to be 1 divided by 0.95, which equals 20, right? Um, and, oops, I'm sorry, now divided by 0 0.05, which is 1 minus 0 0.95, which equals 20. Now compare that to, let's say we save half, okay? So that would be 1 over 0.5, 1 minus, and that gives us a multiplier of 2. Okay, so clearly spending, if we're going to, if, if the change in spending is multiplied with a really big multiplier like this, then that's going to have a dramatic impact on GDP. Whereas if it's by a small 
uh, if we if we save a great deal of it or pay a great deal of taxes or whatever, then it's going to have a much smaller impact. So here are some common numbers. If we save half, then it's going to be 2, 67, etc. This would go down to, to 0.95 would be 20. So often guys will sort of memorize these um, just because they're real, real simple math. So um, the multiplier effect is something that is not sort of agreed upon by everybody in terms of what, uh, what it is and what it does. Um, we know that there's imported products and that's going to take it away, that's going to take away from it. We know that we pay income taxes and that takes away inflation, uh, eats into the multiplier. So certainly if the government in, uh, it puts in a billion dollars and we spend 90%, that doesn't mean that we get $10 billion of economic impact, even though the multiplier would be 10, because we have to take all of these other things into consideration. Some economists even say that this whole multiplier thing just doesn't make any sense. Um, but, com but typical um, mainstream economics does believe that there is some level of multiplier effect, but we don't necessarily agree on how big that is. Um, so there's a really nice uh, box uh, in your book that you should probably read um, that kind of shows the multiplier. It talks about a guy who doesn't buy a car. Uh, I don't remember what pages it, it is offhand, but you should have noticed it. It's called Squaring the Economic Circle. Read it because it really illustrates the multiplier effect well. And that's it, gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Enjoy moving on.